Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Anne Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. Irving Washington is executive director for the Online News Association, ONA, the world's largest membership organization of digital journalists. As a media diversity advocate, Washington has managed programming and fundraising initiatives for journalists, media professionals, and students around the world. Before joining ONA, Washington worked for the National Association of Black Journalists and the Radio Television Digital News Association. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Online news really touches us all. How integral do you think online news is today versus 10, 20 years ago? Yeah, I think online news is critical today. It's how people are getting their news. I believe in the latest uh, research, it's second to TV, primarily in terms of where people are getting their news and the rate at which that's growing. Uh, is continues to to grow rapidly. So I think it's how people um, cons expect to consume news. It's how people are consuming news. And the interesting thing when we um, kind of look back in terms of ONA's origin story, because uh, 20 years ago we were founded, and one of our founders, uh, Rich Jaroskowski, he really described sort of the lay of what the environment was back then. So 20 years ago, there were really two issues that um, shaped ONA, and I think it, it overlays to what digital journalism is today. Um, one, there was a frustration from people who were working in digital journalism 20 years ago who really believed in the internet, um, and they weren't taken seriously, which it sounds a little crazy today, uh, but you know, back then, the internet was looked at it possibly a fad. It, it didn't have a lot of accessibility for, for many people. And so it was looked at as a second project uh, or maybe a product of, of what was happening back then. So it wasn't taken seriously. And, and there was a lot of frustration from people at the time. Rich, who I just mentioned, he worked for the Wall Street Journal uh, with their website. So he was frustrated for one, and there are many people working in that space. And then another piece was really around uh, the credibility of online news in and of itself, in terms of was it a medium that people were going to eventually con consume news. So with those two sort of pieces in mind and people believing in that, that's how uh, ONA was founded. And I think, as you can see, um, 20 years later, that uh, those assumptions about the importance of online news and digital news were correct. Right, and I think it's fair to say Irving, wouldn't you, that the standardization of the editorial rigors of the daily newspaper or evening news, have th those standards have been translated into most every outlet online so that um, those traditional legacy local, state, and national publications, in effect, the reliability is um, just as strong online as it is in print or on TV. It is. It is definitely strong there. And I think one of the things that the um, online journalism has shown is that, you know, the more things change, the more things, you know, also stay the same. Um, the credibility study that I mentioned uh, 20 years ago, I believe it was around, uh, at that time, around 13 percent of folks um, had online news as their most trusted source of news. Um, which obviously wasn't the majority back then, but considering that number went from zero to 13 um, back then, it shows it sort of gave signs that um, online news was going to be a, a medium that that was going to be um, forceful in terms of how we consume news. So I think when people talk about the rigor and the structure of um, doing that, we also have to think about the consumer. 
on that side and that, that they're looking for sort of trusted news sources and that the industry has evolved with that and online news has been a part of that. One of the things that we couldn't say five years ago, certainly not 10 years ago, was that not only had the rigor translated into the dissemination online, but that there was adequate value being placed on it. I remember when Ariana Huffington was testifying back in 2009, along with some of the other new media moguls and editors, and really arguing that we need to validate this. We need to quantify it in terms of the staff and the cost associated with building the online newsroom and then producing the news, especially for those digital specific and digital exclusive outlets. Nowadays, I would say the vast majority of online publications have paywalls. Um, has that been uh, helpful uh, for their self-preservation? Um, has it also caused any kind of backlash that too much online news now is behind a paywall? Yeah, I think uh, as with most, most things, that's a, a complex answer uh, in that regard. So when we look back uh, 20 years ago, online journalists couldn't get press passes, which is another impetus of, right. of when ONA was right. founded. So now that that has been legitimized, um, one of the things when you talk about sort of the revenue and business model yeah. of, of local news and sort of the access to that, I think we, um, for lack of a better word, we had it a little bit easy on the revenue side of things where there was, and by that I mean there was one model, advertising, that um, worked for everyone for the most part. You know, if what worked in D.C. could work in sort of a small rural area and it could be supported or, or the editorial work of journalism could be supported by advertising. And those conversations were two totally different conversations. And I think, you know, over the evolution of, of 20 years, that has changed. But at one point in time, um, it was unheard of for those two conversations of the business and the editorial pieces coming together. Now that that's changed, um, you talk about paywalls, um, that's one business model. And so I think one of the things now that um, both on the consumer side and in the industry that we're grappling with is that there's not a one size fits all model anymore. And so for some news organizations, the paywall will work. And there's communities that uh, can support that and they come from backgrounds that might be able to financially support that. However, that won't be for all communities. and. The interesting thing I've, I've always thought about uh, journalism, um, it really comes with a public service heart. It, even with the commercialized model, it's come with a public service heart. So where I believe we're grappling now is how do we fulfill that public service um, that was in the Constitution for us to have along with the commercialization of that. And that's where I think, you know, in conversations that we're seeing, there are multiple models now that are working. Um, you have the nonprofit news model that is growing at a rapid pace. Um, there's several conversations now around is government supported um, model that will be included as, that well, as well too. Then I think another piece that is um, different now as we move into sort of 2020 is that organizations that might not be um, a legacy organization, people still might be getting news and information from those type of organizations where there's different um, organizations producing content that are still providing news and service to communities. There is some element of, of violating the public service in, in using the paywall um, that can become more and more depressing of news literacy. I, I don't know if you see it that way. Yeah, I think that is uh, it's debated. Yeah. The short answer, it is debated. I think uh, there, there are people that would um, um, say that that, that that has been violated. Um, but then there's the other piece of um, the very real you know, need now for news organizations to be sustainable, right. um, where that advertising model is not working. Um, and then the greater public, again, that public service around what journalism what journalism is. I think what we, what we see is where that debate is um, centering on some middle ground is that uh, there are multiple, pe multiple organizations or players can be in a community that are providing different services and it could be a combination from all those business models. So there could be an organization that has a paywall model, there could be a nonprofit journalism organization in that same community that's doing more of the public good, the service, going to the city council meetings, covering those sorts of things. And there could be a niche publication serving things like education, healthcare, that are getting very specific content to people in the communities. And I think that is what's been probably um, the most difficult to grapple with in the industry as well, too, is 
that there are multiple um, players and organizations involved in how we um, consume and get news and how people are getting news, whereas before you may have had one or two larger sort of legacy publications. And in fairness to some of the paywall advocates and operations, there, there is an increasing tendency to make it affordable so that if you do 99 cents a month or something akin to that, um, be able to have a resource like a Washington Post or New York Times at a, at a very affordable rate um, and that that has led to a great proliferation of subscribers of the, of the national outlets. Of course, what's the challenge, and you mentioned it from the beginning, is local. Would you say of the online news representatives that you work with, local is still the, the, toughest, uh, the toughest beat and the toughest uh, model to, to try to resolve uh, in 2020? Yeah, local is the toughest model to resolve with uh, standard practices, again, of that advertising model. Uh, where we are seeing bright spots is, um, and I think this is something that you know, ONA is championing, is around um, really being connected to your community. Um, and so what we are seeing is beyond sort of that paywall model and where some, there are some local successes are um, events. You know, connecting with the community, literally having your reporters out there connecting with communities with various events and services. Um, you have membership models now where it's not just a paywall. And I think this is the thing that we're seeing more and more now in the conversation. Um, how do you refer to your community? Um, various terms of subscribers, audiences. And now you're literally hearing news organizations talk about community. 20 years ago, that was not the case. Those were readers. And so now you're, you're hearing people talk about community and you're seeing news organizations, particularly at the local level, starting to embed themselves more into their community mm -hmm. and making the community a part of sort of either the story gathering process. And a lot of this also, I think, ties over to the state of journalism where we are now, where, uh, as we all know, trust uh, in news organizations is a, is a huge factor. So I think news organizations are trying to tackle both of those in terms of building that trust along with sort of making new revenue models. How can the local online news survive the massive conglomerates and mergers that we've seen in recent months and years? So to that question, I think, uh, to flip it a little bit. So can local journalism survive? Yes. Can and or will all of the same local news organizations that exist today, will they be here 10, 20 years from now? I don't know. And I think it's important to make that distinction, um, particularly you know, as we have more internal industry conversations. I think we tend to focus on the actual institution uh, or the legacy brand of a journalism um, community. But I think it's really important to note, and, and we see this a lot, I think, on the online space, um, it's filled with startups. And there's a lot of things that are hopeful. Um, and I think it goes to, you know, we focus on innovation a lot. And the tendency is to only think about technology, which is that's work that we do. But innovation is much more broad than that. We were founded on sort of the internet kind of being the impetus of the future. Now when I think about innovation, I also think about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so, you know, to give you an example, in Chicago, you have City Bureau, um, who has a project like the Documenters, which, uh, is bringing the community involved in, to in training them on how to report on local government um, meetings as well too. That's a model that wouldn't have happened 20 years ago. So that's what I mean when, I, when, when we talk about local journalism versus the institutions. Right. Could that model survive? I think there's, there's a good chance that people want to be connected. Um, you know, when you look at uh, something like Sally Lehrman's the Trust Project and Trust Indicators, how people are interacting with news is dramatically different than what it was at the earlier part of the century. And again, I think if you look at models like City Bureau, those are the things that I believe will survive and that's how you'll have access to news and information along with the more commercialized model and still leg some legacy uh, media brands will still be around and they're pivoting to sort of how people want news. I think that there have been benefactors and philanthropists who've operated now in this space it to try to fill the void left by that consolidation. So you see in, in Chicago and in Charlotte and San Antonio, local online based publications pop up and they are basically the new local newspapers. Uh, and that so far can, can be um, described as, as uh, having some successful outcome. 
as a sustainable, in many instances, nonprofit uh, enterprise. Um, many of them write models from uh, Texas and what Evan Smith has done down there. Uh, so if these are popping up and having success, uh, are they really becoming the new local newspapers, uh, these uh, s small nonprofit websites that then emerge in communities and cities as large as a Charlotte or a San Antonio? Yeah, I think they are, but I think there's a caveat to that. I think, um, I think we're literally living in a time where that model of what local journalism is is changing. And I think you'll see more collaborations, which this is already starting to happen. It's been happening for the past decade. Mm -hmm. But you'll actually start to see more collaborations with uh, local news and then how they are um, getting their information. So these, these startups that are happening, they're the start to what I think is something larger sort of on the local media landscape. And again, it goes back to, um, you know, I think the question when we talk about what's happening on the industry side and the, the revenue side of uh, journalism is uh, what's, what's your community saying that they want and how do they, how do they want to get local news? And I think, you know, there was a report last year, and, and these are things that we need to reckon with in terms of um, there's a growing number of people who are actually choosing, selectively choosing not to use news, where I believe in a report last year it was around um, when I view the news, the news <coughs> is typically negative. It lowers my mood. And then also, the, again, the trust factor as well, too. So there's some things that, um, that we have to, I think, reckon as an industry, which these startups, as you see in the, the nonprofit journalism space, and also for-profit, it's not just nonprofit. Overall, they are, um, at their founding, dealing with those issues, not backtracking in it, into it and, and trying to correct for it. For viewers who are interested in a more international lens on this question, uh, where is online news available now that it, that it wasn't in recent years? And where is there still a struggle to be able to have access to information online and, and journalists being protected um, purveyors of information online? I think in general, overall, um, access to, uh, and, and I would say the internet, starting there, access to just yeah. online in general is increasing across the world. Um, and particularly in the news environment, I think there are some, um, you know, bright spots. And, and this is more of a global trend, not just with journalism. Obviously, what's happening in Africa and sort of access there, you, you see this with, I believe, tech companies now, that they are starting to make um, more investments there. And that's because access and information is still, um, evolving and, and changing there, and people are getting more um, context to that. We recently, uh, about three or four years ago, um, held uh, a conference in Japan as well, too, which um, we were working with that community on some of the things in the U.S. in terms of that collaborative environment and that the nature of how um, U.S. organizations are collaborating, that was happening over there in Japan. And so working with um, how can news organizations collaborate as well, too, and I think for um, the UK and what's happening in Europe, while there are some similarities there uh, of what's going on, uh, they've had some models there, whether it's the government supported model or some other models that I think the US can learn from. And uh, again, it's in that spirit of collaboration around um, what are the business models that are working? How are people accessing the information? It's different everywhere. But overall, I think the trend that what we're seeing is that um, while our, our membership base is majority in the U.S., it's a growing population on the international side. But what's causing that growth is sort of the need to learn from each other. What would you say is the most significant obstacle to the virtual newsroom today? Is it the trust factor uh, and, and the fact that many are likely to form assumptions about media on a whim or based on, you know, how the headline reads? Um, or would you say that the organization itself and the ability to collaborate in the way that newsrooms did is, uh, is, is going to present the bigger challenge? Is it going to be more in, an internal challenge or an audience challenge uh, for the long-term trajectory here? There's, there's a bit of both, but I think uh, the external challenge is probably the important one to note. Um, Journalism, the fundamental tenets of journalism is built on the fact um, that if and when I provide you facts, you make informed choices. Right. And I think now we are in a society where, and again, research has shown this, facts necessarily are not the single factor in how I make a decision. 
Um, and so that then does roll into the trust factor and then it rolls into how people um, consume information. So I think we're, we're reckoning with um, our, our fundamental tenet was all we have to do is provide facts. Like that's really all our job is. We, need, we provide facts and it's an important job. It's a job that nobody else was doing. Um, but we're living in society now. And again, if you look at um, just back to that diversity factor, because I, I, I talk about this a lot, how this is a trend. This is more than just a trend. This is more than just a business case. You know, we will be in a majority minority um, country in the U.S. And, and abroad as well, too. And so that's going to change the, the dynamic in the way that people want to interact with news. Um, and I think that piece, that external factor of when um, facts are important and it's the core tenet of what journalism is and will always be, how you are connecting with people and audiences, I think that is going to be probably the biggest thing that we're wrestling with. Um, people want to know who's telling the story, how are you telling the story. Um, in conversations that I've, I've had with many people outside of journalism, um, you know, we talk about bias and you know, we try to report beyond the facts. People will point out whoever decided the story, there's a bias that happened there, whether you're conscious of it or not. Right. And so, um, whereas people did not question that before, people want to know, how did you decide that story? What made that story important? And did you acknowledge any bias that you had in possibly selecting that story? How is that dynamic going to change that you reference with respect to minority, majority status? Uh, how, you know, you, you yeah. hinted at it, but you didn't say it more explicitly. How, how do you think the dynamic will change, and I think part of your question is, will, will we be prepared for that dynamic change? Yeah, I'm hoping we'll be prepared. ONA is doing some work to, to, to make us prepare for that. So a couple of ways that I think the dynamic will change, and actually you, you're already seeing this. Um, one of the ways that I, I, I believe it will change is that there will be an expectation that somebody that looks like me is in your organization and is advocating on issues and things that I believe are important. And there's so many ways you can dissect of how people identify, and, and we're talking about race and gender and socioeconomics. There's so many ways that people will identify, but that will no longer be a nice to have. People will expect that there is somebody represented in your organization, preferably at various leadership levels. Um, so that those stories are surfacing. And I think there's going to be accountability factor. You, you see this now. Um, one of the ways that we actually promote, um, encourage people to do that is to share their diversity numbers just as sort of a low-hanging fruit start. Um, you know, NPR has done that. Vice is doing that. The city here in New York, I think, started out the gate um, doing that. But people are, are going to demand accountability around knowing, um, you know, where do you stand on diversity in terms of your organization. So I, I, I fully see that. Um, fully see that as a trend. And I think the next part of that is going to be um, how am I reflected in the coverage and stories? So if, if you're making the investments and really engaging people internally, externally, I should see that in the stories. And then how am I involved um, in, that, in that story creation process as well too? And what are the opportunities to give feedback um, you know, not necessarily make this just a one-way communication. Uh, we've used community, and I've used community a lot in this in this conversation. But I think it's it's probably the single most important thing that um, people will expect to make communities out of organizations that they're attached to, and that includes news organizations and where they get their information from. Was there any reaction within your colleagues in online news to? the Washington Post's response to a reporter who tweeted a story that was unfavorable about Kobe Bryant after his death, not immediately, not the second after learning the report, but there was, there's been some discussion that Marty Barron and his standards for reporters and what they're disseminating in online forums uh, like Twitter or Facebook um, is too much of a, uh, company mandate uh, and uh, is actually going to stifle freedom of expression. In this particular instance, this is a woman reporter who had documented sexual assault, was sharing the story in theory a few hours after his death because most of the early obits were not covering that aspect of Bryant's career, uh, which was not an insignificant one. I'm wondering how your members responded to that event and, and their feeling about company-wide policies um, really micromanaging how reporters use social media 
in, in addition to how they're editing their stories. Yeah, I think there's sort of probably two ways in the response to that. As with, as with most things, there's a sort of a mixed response to that. Um, the side I think everyone can collectively uh, agree on is uh, probably one of the most interesting things in that um, particular situation is the last time that the social media policy had been looked at, which I believe was quite a, quite a while. Um, so I think news organizations overall, when you look at it from an online industry standpoint, um, how things are evolving online and sort of what are, uh, what that, how that connects to um, reporters and people who work for the organization, that's something that has to be looked at very frequently because the nature and the rapid pace of how technology is changing. So I think there's one inside sort of internal piece of that. The external piece of that, um, again, I think that goes toward, um, you asked like one of the, the, the changes that the demographic shift will, will, will have, and that goes toward how does the industry sort of respond when there are different and new voices um, in the newsroom as well too? And one of the things that I think we're seeing right now, and we'll probably see this for quite some time, I actually think one of the signs of um, pushing forward with diversity and when you're making strides is actually when you have that tension and that tension is called out. Um, and by that, what I mean is when you actually start making places more inclusive, that initial period should feel uncomfortable because nine times out of 10, you had people who were homogenous and perhaps looked the same, came from the same background. When you actually start incorporating diversity and inclusion and actually making those individuals feel included, they will likely challenge some of the norms right. and how things right. were done before. And that's gonna cause friction. But I think when you get past that, that's where conversations start to happen. And I think this is an example of that. And that's what forward. seemed to happen, which is her colleagues, uh, Wesley Lowry, my friend among them, got behind her and said the editor was wrong in, um, in attempting to muzzle her. And um, the suspension was ultimately revoked and she was reinstated. But Marty didn't apologize. We'll leave it there. I uh, appreciate your time, Irving, very much in this important subject. Thank you so much. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.